Hey everybody, Steve Witt here, and here we are again, all gathered together across this great land to flourish. Ashley, you, Ashley, what's your name, Ashley? Right, <laughs> <laughs> Ashley. It's Ashley. Are you ready Ashley to flourish? Jordan. Yes, I'm ready to. Flourish. What'd you think about this week, <laughs> Ashley? Here we are in week two, right? Week two. Yeah. We've been reading, 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 reading all kinds yeah. of stuff. Hundreds of things to talk about, but oh only gosh. a couple that we can cover. Only a couple. You know what's interesting about um, our reading this week is I think the uh, last year when I went through scripture, I don't know that Abraham stood out to me as much. Uh, like when I was reading through the word, there were different people in the Bible and things that would stand out to me. And I don't recall Abraham really standing out a whole lot this last time I went through the word. But this time, I, I he's like jumping off the page. He hey. is jumping off the yes. page. Yes, Abraham's <laughs> Abraham, off the page. A- Abram, Abraham yeah. Abram. is known. He's probably one of the five great figures of the Old Testament, yeah. if not the number one. I, I mean, he's the seed of Judaism, yeah. the first Jew. And, and of course, tangential to that, Christians that came mm-hmm. out of the Jewish sect. And so we're very Jewish related. We we are thankful for the Jews for our roots, and uh, we ventured off there somewhere around Acts chapter ten, as the Gentiles got touched through Cornelius. And uh, oh, by the way, Ashley, am I reaching? Am I reading? Am I using my preaching voice? <laughs> Ashley said last week I use like three different voices. So, so all of you judge out there, make comments if you need to on the page or whatever. But if he's being too preachy, <laughs> yeah. So if I get if I'm too, she says I have a preachy voice. So so I got, I got to watch that. I thought this is really how I talk at you have Starbucks. A professional and, voice. And every and then... oh, I have a professional voice too. So anyway, I'm a little self conscious right now, but I'm going to go into this and see what happens. I'm but sorry. let me just give you a little bit of start in Abraham because yeah. He he is the key man of the week here. <laughs> he is. And we really need to know. I mean, he's mentioned like, I think like 300 times. I've got it written down here somewhere oh in Scripture. Like everybody quotes him. Everybody who's anybody quotes him throughout Scripture because he is like Stephen did, you know, in his famous speech before he was uh, martyred. He mentions Abraham. I mean, Peter, Paul, they all mention Abraham because it's like the source of the covenant with God that changes everything. Yeah, I um, I, I think I, I just didn't understand. I think now that he's jumping out of the page to me, I'm understanding the weight of Abraham. I was like, you know, everyone always talks about Abraham, but why don't we hear about Moses as much, you know, because <laughs> Moses stood out to me last time. But um, when I was reading it, um, Genesis 15, I guess if we dive right into it, that Genesis chapter 15. Well, Moses wrote all the pentateuch. I know so. they're they're connected. Yes. So that that that's another question I have for later. So he liked episode. Abraham. He wrote very favorably about him. Yeah, he did. Moses, wow, he's fascinating. But that's another story for another day. Um, if in Genesis 15, verse 12, I guess my first question is: the scripture struck me because it says, "Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and behold, horror." And great darkness fell upon him. Now, what happens after this is the Lord, then the Lord speaks to him and gives him a promise. So a deep sleep fell on him. And it said, behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Why is that what they're mentioning right before the Lord makes a promise? Yeah, I think that's Abraham. called the the famous dark night of the soul, you know. And it is, I think it becomes a template that when God's ready to do something extraordinary, there is a, a rearrangement of sorts that happens in our in our soul. Like it's a, I think it's something with preparation. I mean, someone out there may have a much better answer. I have looked at that many, many times over the years, and most times I just skip over it because, wow, that's 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 a mystery. You know, it's a mystery. Yeah. But now we kind of refer to a dark night of the soul as a troubled time that caused transformation of our soul. Yeah. I just think it was interesting that it references horror and darkness right before the Lord speaks to him. Because you would think then, you know, he had a vision that was horrifying and, you know, this epic horrifying vision, but it was just the Lord speaking a promise. So what about it was horror and darkness? There is, I mean, I just think there's something of the fear of the Lord. We were talking about this the other day. You know, I always come up, I always think of that verse in Corinthians that says, knowing the terror of God, terror of the Lord, persuade men. 
And it's like a, a motivation for evangelism. It's actually in the context of being Christian ambassadors and sharing your faith and everything. And it's like, that's an odd way, you know. And, and of course, it says in Scripture that the the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, which we were talking mm -hmm. about the other day. So there's something about, I don't know, was that his initiation into a a time of advancement and wisdom? Could be. Yeah. You know, I don't, what do you think? I don't know. You've been I'm, pondering when it comes to your mind. Pondering. I don't know where I, I, I guess the part that led after it is just Abraham experienced the Lord in a really great measure um, with encountering the Lord in person. And so I, I, I read something like this and what it causes me to question is what was it about Abraham that he experienced these things? And I know that the Bible talks over and over about his faith. Um, and I think in reading scripture, I've often found I ask that question when I read, like, what about David? What was it specifically that the Lord chose him over other people? And we know he's a man after God's own heart, but there were lots of people on the earth at that time. And what was it specifically about him? So I wondered, like, Abraham, what was it specifically about Abraham that he was able to have these great deep encounters with the Lord? Um well, was, you know, was it just his faith? There's no doubt that, that God has led towards certain people. And yeah. I believe it's the condition of the heart. They're not perfect. They they may not even be educated or, you know, uh, full in understanding of who God is. But there's something about a tenderness of heart that he sees or a potential or something like that. We see that in Joseph and Mary. Why were they picked yeah. above all else, especially Mary, Hale, favored one, you know, we talked about last time. So there's even in David, like D David uh, become, becomes great, really, beginning in his days in the field, you know, and uh, rejected by his brothers and everything else. It's obvious that he's not the preferred one in the family except by his, by his father and by the Lord. And so he's the guy out in the field and, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, there's this— uh, I wonder if it's something about heart posture. Like, you know, obviously the Lord sees things that we don't. But if there's something about the way they postured their heart in their relationship with the Lord or something about their personal kind of connection with the Lord, if that kind of plays a part in it. because yeah, well, What's interesting about it, though, Ashley, is that in Christ, does everyone become a David? In wow. Christ, does everyone become a Mary? Hmm. Because in the Old Testament, you see the preference that happens. and It's a mystery of how it happens. But in the New Testament, we're all presented, it feels like we're presented in in common, unique ways before the Lord, that he loves us all in yeah. an equal way, that we all get the coat of many colors, you know, that we yeah. all, but what we do with that is the key, you know? <clears throat> so if that's true, which I don't know if it is or not, yeah. <laughs> if it is true, then we're, uh, you know, our, our passion is to be is to take what God's given us and live to the fullest, you know, present our bodies, Romans, present our bodies a living sacrifice, yeah. you know, sacrificing ourselves to the Lord, saying, Lord, this is yours. My life is yours. That's really what giving your life fully, you know, we're starting with that right now, and probably we're going to end with this if we get over into Matthew in a little while. So, but you know, with Abraham, just go back, give a little bit of history quickly, because some of this is not clear in Scripture, but he did come out of this huge city called Ur. They believe it had 60,000 people in wow. the time of Abraham, which would be a mega city back then. I mean, that's, you got to think, I forget, what what is Abraham, 20 generations from Adam or 10? I forget yeah, right something... now. He's, he's not that far from the creation of the world, really. I mean, some time's passed, obviously, because people were living a long time. But uh, he's from Ur of Chaldees, which was down the river going into the Persian uh, Ten Sea. Ten generations. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Ten generations. Wow. So he's 10 generations out, which is not that far when you no. think of history. And he, he's, uh, you know, he's born, what, what is it, 2027 or somewhere around there. I have the, again, I have the number here. Near, but Ur was a, I, I did a little deep dive on it the other day, and there's different views of it. Some say it was like a totalitarian state. Others say, actually, it's one of the first organized cities. It was probably one of the top five largest cities in the world at the time. Wow. So very metropolitan city for that time, still very ancient. And, uh, you know, they're still discovering a lot of stuff in in, <laughs> in ways that would seem very primitive to us. But... They had woolen factories going on there where they were 
They were teaching people. They actually had a cultural economic ladder that you could climb where not, you know, it felt like everyone was a slave in a sorts because there was an elite group leading it. All this to say is that Abraham came out of a place that was a bit democratic and a bit, uh, he was leaving not just, uh, you know, his homeland and all that when he's called out. He's leaving uh, New York City. Wow. He's leaving the place that everyone wants to go to. In fact, all the civilization has been flowing down the Euphrates to the end of the Euphrates where Ur was. Abraham chooses to go against the flow. So he goes, he goes, well, it's kind of northeast. He goes northeast and it ends up in Haran, as the Bible tells us, which strangely enough is the name of his brother, right? Terah was his father, yeah. Abraham was his brother. He goes there and it's at that, it's that point he gets called out. So uh, that fascinates me that, you know, the, the Jews, again, they had this idea that that Abraham left Ur because uh, it says over in uh, Joshua, you, of course, you won't learn this yet till we get over there. <laughs> in Joshua, Joshua, I think it's Joshua preaching, he refers to Abraham, one of the other guys, refers to him and says he has other information that is not giving, given in uh, the book of Genesis. And he says that Abraham and his father were idol worshipers. So he was an idol worshiper that got led to Haran. In Haran, the promise of God or the call of God comes to him, and he's called out to leave his family and go to this undisclosed area uh, to follow after the voice of God. Wow. Yeah. So, you, you know, you get, he feels more human to me when I start thinking about that. Like he was a normal guy, he was working a job. Somehow they get connected, you know, he gets, he gets what we'd call born again or saved. You know, he starts yeah. to believe in God. And when he does that, that changes their, their economic status because, you know, they got to get rid of the, uh, the idol shop that his father owned. And Jews say that Abraham burned down his shop, his shop, his father's shop. And that's why they had to flee. And wow. they fled Ur, they ended up in Haran, eventually made their way over into what is now present day, what was Canaan, now present day uh, Israel and other areas around Israel. Wow. I did look in um, it kind of something about Abraham, you said, when he got saved. Um, in Genesis 17. Yeah, obviously that's not Old Testament no, terms. No, but. but in Genesis 17, verse 22, something that also stuck out to me was the way that he his relationship worked with the Lord, that it seems as if the Lord appeared to him on multiple occasions. Yes. And so what it did is it caused me to question. I know in scripture, it talks about how no one can see the face of God and live. And I mean, even Moses couldn't see God. He had to look at his back as he walked away. So how was Abraham experiencing the Lord? Cause he appeared to him. It says, in Genesis 17, verse 22, then he finished talking with him and God went up from Abraham. So that implies that God was there. How did the Lord communicate with Abraham? Then there was also when he's sitting outside his tent, it says the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamar as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day, which is a reference to. Well, there, you know, and in, yeah, in that case, you know, the when the 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 three men, two angels and and it appears and it to be a theophany like of Christ, yeah, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. It seems like there, and by the way, it's interesting. The angels go ahead because they're in there. You know, they're eager to get to yeah. to Sodom. These are probably, I, I don't know if this these are archangels or seraphim. Seraphim, by the way, are God's arsonist. I mean, they're burning angels. They go to burn, wow. and so they. It makes me think that seraphim were there somehow, yeah. but they were on their way to burn and destroy Sodom. And then the the third man, which which is referred to as the Lord, yeah, stops to talk to Abraham. He's referred to as the Lord and the angel of the Lord, which we know if you read scripture, it, most theologians believe that the angel of the Lord is referencing a theophany, is what as what you said of the Lord appearing to him. But when he showed up at his tent, it didn't seem like Abraham was surprised. So it no, seems I, as if maybe there was a familiarity that he's experienced the Lord in this manner before. And his response was to wash their feet, make them food. Yes. Yeah. You know what? There's a, uh, there's a book actually I, I just gave to someone here on staff 
the other Ashley, and uh, it's called Walking the Bible. It's written some years ago, some years like a decade ago, New York Times bestseller. It's not a Christian book written by a uh, Jewish guy, Bruce uh, Feiler, who had who was a great award-winning author. He wrote this book, Walking the Bible, A Journey by Land Through the Five Books of Moses. He also wrote a book, another book called Abraham. Anyway, here in here, he talks about it, and Abraham would have openly welcomed anyone walking by because they're nomadic people. The very nomadic people were very hospitable. Yeah. Anytime someone came by, it's really like this up until medieval times. There was no broad, you know, it wasn't CNN, Fox News, all that. You know, there's no broad ways of uh, distributing information. So any information you had, there could be uh, warriors coming toward you to kill you and you wouldn't know about it, you know. They're coming over until you see them on the hilltop. So these these journeyers, these pilgrims coming along, whoever they might be, were very interesting. So what you wanted to do, you're making an exchange. Yeah. Give me information and I will feed you. And it's exactly what they did. This yeah. all also is similar to uh, a passage in the New Testament that were to entertain strangers. Angels, unaware. Be hospitable because yeah. you do not know that you might be entertaining a messenger, an angel. That's what I thought of when I read that. Yeah, thought, that's that exactly what similar. happened. That's probably what yeah. whoever was wrote that, Paul in the New Testament. Yeah. He was probably referring to the Abrahamic uh, hospitality. He does call him Lord, though, capital That was L. a common, yeah. Well, that was a common, okay. uh, you know, you're trying to honor someone, you're calling them Lord, because even in the New Testament, it says, by the way, I might remind you of this. It says that wives may call their husband Lord. Yeah. Uh, so you know, there's something, <laughs> something of a, there's something of a, uh, Thank you kind of an tip. honoring sort of person. <laughs> but the, you know, making it capitalized, that's what the the, the <laughs> translators did. You know, and and it's probably right. You know, he yeah. was, we know because we know later on that. He was not just a, he was not an angel. The, yeah. One of them was the. Well, he had to have known it the was flesh. the Lord too. Cause right. I di also didn't realize in the timeline that when he hosted these people at his tent, that immediately they're walking on the journey to where he negotiates with the Lord. So he knows he, he has to know he's talking with the Lord because he's negotiating for the righteous people to be saved in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so. Well, they, remember they, they talk back and forth and they go, should we share this? Uh, yeah, yeah. The Lord says, should I share this with Abraham? Right. Which I think is interesting. It's kind of I one think of it's tongue things, in like, cheek myself. I have a secret. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> should it's I tell like this the person right in front I of me? I think that's like a <laughs> Middle Eastern way of creating curiosity. Should yeah. I share what I know? You know, and it's <laughs> like, well, okay, what do you know? Yes. And so the Lord, I, I, I view the Lord that way. There's, there's humor. There's that irony, satire, whatever that flows through the Lord. I, I love that about heaven. He created all that. So he's talking to him. But what's interesting, you know, I they eat. Yeah. So I angels eat. Mm -hmm. You know, angels eat, angels at first they decline. Drink. They say no thank you. <laughs> yeah. And he and he calls out Sarah, you know, fix the what they have, lamb or something. Fix cakes. They had cakes. Cakes. Yeah, fix some cakes. <laughs> like like we're talking ancient times. How long does it take to fix cakes? Yeah, Did she have them in the cabinet somewhere and just warm them up in the microwave? You know, so you're Maybe. talking about an all day thing because yeah. they they cooked a lamb or something. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I, what was that like then? Spending the whole day with yeah, two it was a whole day. And the Lord, like what the, was their conversation? That's what they did. They hung out. Yeah. They chatted. It was like the road to Emmaus. Who knows what they were sharing with him, giving wow. him insights, understanding. Maybe he was connecting as they were talking. Like, oh, this is something. These are not just messengers. These are these are, these are heavenly beings. Yeah. So he feeds them, and then there's a promise. I love this. I've preached on this many times over the years, but hospitality in the church opens revelatory doors. Yeah, I agree. It does. If you invite friends over, you're gonna you're gonna hear something, see something, feel something, sense something that isn't normal. That's why that's why hospitality in the church. You know, it says one of the four cornerstones in the Book of Acts was what was it? Prayer fellowship, breaking of bread, and the Word of God. Is it? Yeah. I trust you. So fellowship, knowledge. yeah. <laughs> I didn't know there'd be a quiz. Fellowship <laughs> was uh, was one of the top four uh, values of the New Testament church because when you break bread together, it's, it's the, remember when Jesus broke bread? Revelation came. Yeah. Their eyes were open. When you break bread together, I believe that applies Anywhere in life, you know, maybe even in a secular realm, I got to be careful what I say here, but there's something about fellowship, even among thieves kind of a thing yeah. where they, 
there's a greater enjoyment. I'm with friends. There's a connection. Yeah. Wow. I just keep thinking of what it would have been like to sit there for the whole day. It's one of those instances where you wish that the Bible would expand expand a little bit more on. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. I love I love this whole passage. Was like. And I I I get my preachy voice if I spend too much time on it. So. Yeah. But uh, what I love after that is they go down into into the valley. Two of to the two angels yes. went ahead. So these two angels show up in Sodom. This is a fascinating story. They show up in Sodom because they're going to rescue Lot. Yeah. You know, they kind of made this little negotiation. Yeah. Abraham did not win in the negotiation. No. They tried to get 10. They couldn't find 10. But but they get Lot and the and the kids, you know. And his daughters and his wife. Right. So so people in town recognize these two strange men that are in town. And the, I mean, the level of evil that is yeah. in Sodom, I don't even know what to compare it to on earth today, but it's so bad. They're pressing up against the door. They're demanding that, that, Lot open the door and let these men out so that they may have quote unquote relations with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a, and, and it, it gets weirder. So then Lot, by the way, who in the New Testament is called righteous Lot. So, so remember daughters. that, keep that in your mind. <laughs> yeah. God calls him righteous Lot. Righteous yeah. Lot offers them his daughters. Take my daughters instead of the strangers. Yes. Mm -hmm. What is that about? I've got some questions now. You I tell do me what too. Like that's horrible. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you read it and you go, "I don't know that I like this lock guy." That seems, I mean, I well, the, you know, this is interesting though. But because you know, when he didn't first go to Sodom, the Bible says he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Mm. So he set up camp near Sodom. The next thing we know, he's living in Sodom, and he's like a gatekeeper. He's a, he's a head guy there. He's he's one of the like magistrates, or I don't know what he was, but he he had a voice. He was elected to office or something. I don't know what happened. So he was deep in the culture. I guess a modern application would be like being careful how close you associate exactly. with sin. Yes. Because it can kind of suck it's you crouching in. crouching at if your you're door. Not, oh, I'm not. Yeah, it's crouching at your door. You, even though I'm not in the city, you are near to it. And what's near to the city can affect your life. Yeah, and it did. And so, uh, so anyway, of course, they refused to. So the angel cracks the door open and uh, they all get blinded. Now, I just read this over again this morning and I thought, so they get blinded by an angel and they're still trying to get in the door. Wow. Like, what is that? That is like evil to the 10th yeah. power. I mean, they're so bad. And so, uh, so finally, I guess, you know, things settle down or whatever. And they, they finally, uh, angels even offer to go stay out in the street. You know, they don't need to come in. They probably sensed there was going to be trouble or whatever. But then, uh, of course, they grab his hand. Lot does not want to leave. They have to grab him and literally pull him out of the city. And so they begin like they to— They put a lot of effort in to save Lot. You yes. know, even when they couldn't find righteous people, they still wanted to honor the Lord's relationship with Abraham. Was that why Lot was righteous? Because of Abraham's righteousness? Wow. I mean— was it his reference, his referral? Yeah. You know, hey, uh, could you remember, you know, Lot? Yeah. My nephew. And of course they did. Yeah. But they had to pull him out. And and it's the tension of it that you feel is heaven is wanting to hit this thing in the night, yeah. which is a strategic warfare thing. And they had to wait till day for it to come down. And so the angel says, like, you know, we we can't wait much longer. Yeah. And so they get a certain way out of town. And he goes, you need to, you need to quickly get up in the mountains so you will not be consumed. And it infers that, that Lot could still be consumed if he doesn't get moving. Yeah. And then he picks a little town nearby, Zoar. Zo yeah, he didn't want to go into the cave. To, yeah, to, to go the there. Yeah. And uh, so he goes into Zoar and ends up in the mountains. So, and then the fire comes down. Abraham sees it from the distance and, and it's totally destroyed, mm -hmm. the whole valley. And his wife is gone. And his wife's gone. She, she looked back after being really advised not to, you know, to... Keep your eyes forward. It's like, you know, it's like so many things in life. So Don't do this. And it's yeah. the first thing you do, yeah. you know. She turns and looks back and gets turned into a pillar of salt. Wow. It's funny. If you go over there now in the Dead Sea near where yes. Sodom is, there's these pillars of salt. Yeah, there. I've seen pictures. Yeah, and they, they call them Lot's wife. You know, it's, yeah. uh, I was there in 84. It was just, the whole place is so magical and mystical. Uh, as you know, you're at the place where all these things happen. So. Yeah. Well, before we move into... Uh, Matthew, because you had some things you wanted to discuss about Matthew. I did want to step back for a second to when they're in the tent together, because there was something that I noticed that I don't think I've ever seen before. 
in that when the Lord promises Abraham, this is back with the angels. Well, this is this is in our reading, but it does involve the angels in the tent. Is when the Lord promises Abraham Isaac, Abraham laughs. He falls oh, on his yes. face and laughs. And I don't know. I think when I've thought of the story, I've only ever really known that Sarah was the one that laughed. But Abraham laughed. And then when the Lord tells uh, Sarah this, she laughs. But the response with the Lord is different to both of them. And so I wondered what your thoughts were on why, what the difference was. I mean, the the laugh could have been different. You know, Abraham was laughing out of joy and kind of like, I can't believe this is happening kind of thing. And Sarah's laughing out of disbelief. Yeah, I, I, do, I do think that was it. Like, uh, you know, as we all know, there's different kinds of laughs and you can tell by how someone laughs, whether they're being sarcastic, yeah. whether they're frustrated, like, yeah, right. You know, or it's like, I mean, I, I see Abraham, I think the Bible said he fell down or something. He fell down yeah. on his face he and fell, laughed. He fell down and he was just, I think he was like one of those weeping, crying laughs. Yeah. Where you're so excited, like, oh, that's just, I can't, here I am in my old, in my old age. And he, the Bible said he had looked at himself and counted himself yeah. as dead. And then Sarah laughs and the Lord's like, why, why is she laughing? Right. But what's interesting is if you fast forward to Hebrews, and it talks about by faith, you know, faith with Abraham. It mentions Sarah's faith as well. So yeah. like her laughing well, in disbelief didn't disqualify her from being recognized for her faith. Right. And it was so important that they named Isaac laughter. Yeah. You know, Isaac means laughter. And so it was named after the proper response to a promise of God. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I, I would, you know, if I was going to connect the dots, I would say somewhere between the, in the conception period or the, yeah. The period they waited for Isaac to be born, uh, Sarah's mind shifted on it. And yeah. She started having faith. Like, wait, okay, no, Abraham's really serious about this, and and you know, I, yeah, I'm believing. I mean, too. if I was in my 80s and someone told me that I was going to have a baby, I don't know that my response would be much different. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. Like an for, incredulous for a woman, laugh, it'd be like, like okay, yeah, right. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, even in your 50s and 60s, it is, <laughs> yes. let alone way up there. So, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and the other thing, Ashley, that was pretty fascinating, too, that I, I mentioned to you earlier today was the um, the daughters of Lot. Yeah. That when they finally get up on the mountain, mm -hmm. uh, Sodom's been destroyed. Uh, this weird thing happens where they, this ancestral thing happens yeah. where they, they, get them they make a little deal like, we're going to get our father drunk. Mm -hmm. And go into the cave, have relations with him, and then we'll get him drunk the next night, and then you can do it. And you're thinking, what? I mean, this is this is perverse, I think, in any time throughout the ages. But I go back to thinking, wait, Lot was ready to offer his daughters to this horde and of people. And we're outraged at this. We, yeah, <laughs> yeah, was just outraged at the— Yeah. And, and then this—what do you—you you got any thoughts on that? I don't. We we actually got a couple questions in our Flourish Facebook group yeah. regarding this story. Well, I'm not really sure why it's something. I, I don't re recall what the resolution was. Like, why is it something that was included in Scripture? Like, what's the significance in needing to know that story? Because if everything's in the Bible is not accidental, then there has to be some purpose. Or is it just history? <laughs> I don't just, know. Part of it is uh, they, they had been... Uh, I mean, thinking too, Abraham and Sarah are half brother, half sister. So, yes. so we are talking ten generations out from Adam, and there's not a lot of choices of marriage. And yeah, there was a lot of that. Maybe that was a more common thing back there among mature adults. I have no idea, but I do know that it happened, and I do know that that was a realistic strategy for them. Mm. I just think it's odd. Like you, I think, why is this included? In this yeah. verse, this is going to cause people to stumble, you know, yeah. but there's something in it where the God's communicating to us through revelation that, hey, uh, this happened. And again, yeah. I think it, you know, from a 21st century view, it continues to show us that God looks at our lives, not always on the details of our mistakes or difficulties or challenges or whatever we have, the weight and the sin, his forgiveness, his power of his blood is that to move you on. You keep a heart that is tender and yeah. and open to the Lord, but he he still uses people. Yeah. Even in crazy situations like that. Crazy ones. So where do you want to go with Abraham now? Now will you want to jump ahead and look at I mean, there's so much to talk about and we're almost out of time here. <laughs> 
Uh, we might I, as well go uh, to the words of Jesus. Okay. I do want to say, you know, the whole Ishmael thing. I mean, there's a great lesson in that birthing an Ishmael oh and goodness. everything that Abraham, he, he actually, Sarah came up with the idea yeah, and shared and convinced Abraham. Like a, that was probably some big convincing thing, you know, and uh, so that they could have a a child. Mm -hmm. So that showed you what she wasn't quite yet in the camp that well, she, she was, was going to. It seemed like they were consistently trying to rush. Well, this was hurry 12, along the This was 12 years the down the road. Yeah. It seems like they were trying to kind of, you know, the no, no, Lord it was one a, year down the road. Sorry. It was one year. Yeah. When, when the Lord makes them a promise, it seems yes. like they try to hurry the promise, hurry it along yes. in multiple places. It's not just in this story, but in multiple places. Well, like places. we all do. Yeah, like okay, it's, God's timing is. Oh, He wants me to feels do this. Like it's taking a long time, <laughs> right? You know. <laughs> so they get Hagar, and that's yeah. the. So we use that at birthing in Ishmael, which is choosing something that later on becomes a problem for you. Yeah. But I love the fact that God gives an immense blessing to Ishmael. Oh yes. Even though they go through so all this powerful. pain and sorrow, and it was like a mistake that was made. God turns that mistake into something beautiful, and His care for humanity, even if you feel like you were born a mistake. He's got a promise for you, too. I also thought it was interesting that Ishmael is noted to be there to bury Abraham with Isaac. Oh, yeah. And so, like, he's sent away. How did they keep in contact? How did they, you know, did Ishmael show up um, after Sarah died? Because he was like, okay, cause Sarah wanted them to leave because she felt competition she was afraid for Isaac that he wouldn't right. get the promise. So Ishmael and Hagar well, left. She came back for a while. But but Ishmael was there to bury Abraham. So what kind of, you know, I just thought that was an interesting note yeah. in Scripture that he came back. Yeah, you know what? what we that, think though. we live in tough times. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I know. Anyway, let's go over the New <laughs> Testament for a few minutes. We're trying to keep it at 35 minutes, and we're growing dangerously close to that right now. Yeah. Uh, Matthew 5 through 7, you've got to go. I'd almost encourage you, if you haven't read it yet, read it. If you have read it, go back and read it again. <laughs> Matthew 5 through 7 is Sermon on the Mount. It is the, the Beatitudes are included in that. The attitudes you should be, <laughs> the Beatitudes. And... Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is is upside down civilization. I mean, it's it's a different. It's heaven on earth. It is so counterintuitive to the human way. And you know, if, if you think this, God says that. You know, if if you're going to treat your enemies this way, God says treat them that way. I mean, it's a master handbook on extraordinary faith, long suffering, the fruit of the spirit, and just going the extra mile with with people of. Of difficulty, you know. So, did, what did you get out of that? You were mentioning Matthew five before we got on here. Yeah, I think. I mean, the whole thing was really beautiful this time around. I read it in the Passion Translation because I like to. I, I sometimes I like to change it up a little bit to get different translations, and um, it's powerful to read the words of Jesus in the Passion Translation. It just adds. It feels like it adds a weightiness to it, or a reality to yeah. it. Um, and just the thing that stood out to me was the scriptures about letting your words ring true and that a simple yes or no will suffice. I just think we live in a culture of people who, a lot of people who make promises and and then change their mind or they, you know, they say yes to something and then change it because something better comes along. And, and so I very often I'm like, well, people just let your yes be yes, you know? know, and, and it's just seeing how, how important it is to the Lord and the passion translation has fantastic footnotes that lead you back to Ecclesiastes. Oh yeah. Go to those footnotes. Testament. They're amazing. So, yeah. They're, they're worth their weight in gold for sure, because you learn a lot and, um, it's just, I just thought it was really powerful. I don't know why it stood out to me, but it did. Well, there's a lot of things like that in this whole passage. It's it's a game-changing uh, uh, section to read. I, You know, when I read it, I think, are there any Christians out there? You know, I mean, am I a Christian? <laughs> I a Christian? <laughs> it's, yes. You know, it's just like, wow. <laughs> it, it, it Christ lays forth an ideal that, by the way, is achievable, not by legalism, but by, by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. The Spirit is here as your helper to lead you to, to be the person that's that. Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. What hit me at the end, and we'll close with this, is uh, uh, Jesus starts talking about false prophets, you know, will come to you in sheep's clothing. And uh, it's interesting, he has this little trilogy that he comes up with, you know, a false prophets, sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Uh, and then he says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, uh, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he, he who does the will of the Father. So he's doing these, like, 
comparisons that, and then the third one is, uh, have you not prophesied? Have we not, you, you will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? Have we not cast out demons? Have we not uh, had many wonders, signs and wonders? And then what will the Lord say? I never knew you. Yeah. And so you read this, you're like, what? It's terrifying. This is terrifying. <laughs> it's terrifying because it, it describes the church throughout history. It describes the church to this day. And you realize, wait, am I, am I a false prophet in sheep's clothing? Uh, uh, you know, appearing to be something, but inside of something else. So it deals with, you know, I've, this is how I summed it up. The first section is about titles and position. Hmm. You know, if you're just into titles and positions, I mean, you've got to continually be plowing your heart before the Lord and seeking the Lord. The tenderness of the Lord and his mercies are new every morning so that you're not the ravenous wolf. And you say, well, aren't you securing your salvation? Yes, I am. But I'm presenting myself to the Lord as a sacrifice. I want to live pleasing to Him, and I have to do that through faith. And not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, I want to be the person that says, Lord, Lord, and yet doesn't do the will of the Father. That's people who speak and are religious, but they're really not doing it. I mean, our churches are full of people. Our church, of course, does not fall in that category. But other churches out there, laugh, laugh, but the other (laughs) churches out there, you know, there's, there's lots of people that go to church every Sunday that, that the Lord's going to say, I, I don't know you. Who are you? That would be tragic. Because the third one is, we're not prophesying, casting out demons, doing signs and wonders. That's our church. Yeah, That's what we believe in. But then the Lord says, I never knew you. So there's something about the actions and the supernatural and all that. Doing things that are supernatural and even good deeds is not guaranteeing that you you know no. God. It's about the posture of your heart, too. Yeah, it is. If that's what it goes back to, ultimately, is the, you know, all these things are meaningless. If you read in Ecclesiastes, you know, but. Um, yeah. And then he takes us right after that to, uh, you don't be a hearer, only be a doer. Yeah. There's strong emphasis on doer. And then he gives us the illustration, the parable, you know, the house on the rock. You build a house on a rock. We like to see that as Christ. We also like to see it as his word. You build a house on the rock and come wind, come waves. And this encouraging for this year, 2025, come wind, come waves, the house on the rock will stand firm. Hey, yeah. this is Steve Witt, Ashley Brogan saying, we'll see you next week. Keep studying the word of God. Don't get stopped. Don't, Don't get this. discouraged. Keep going. We're going to get through this and we're going to learn amazing things together this year. God bless and have a great week. Mm-hmm.